Well, amen. Amen. You know, last week I started this message on, on transhumanism. But it, the, the transhumanism message just kind of snowballed, really. It wasn't where I really wanted to go, but it just kind of went that way, which I'm okay with that because I like talking about stuff like that and, and seeing what's all going on in the world. But it all come to this message is where I wanted to get to. And, uh, you know, when we, we look at things in the world today, we have a real problem in churches. We have a real problem in churches because of the fact that the gospel isn't being preached in the way it should be. And to me, that's a, that's a catastrophe. And, and it's something that's going to destroy the church and, and, and people in general. Because when it comes to life, there's nothing more important than carrying a, a complete biblical worldview. We have to come to that place where the Bible is the center of everything I believe. Uh, all my belief system is based upon the Word of God. Because if it's not, we're not sold out to God. If it's not, we're not going to put Him in a place where He needs to be. So to me, when I look at my life, I want to center it around that view. Do I do other things in my life? Yeah, I like playing in my garage. I like doing this and that. But my desire is the Word of God, to study, to, to be in that, and, and to learn from it. Because that's where every thought and every desire that I have is based. And if I can base my desires on that very thing, it makes all the difference in the world because it allows my mind not to be infiltrated by the things of the world. If the things of the world begin to infiltrate my mind, it's just a matter of time before I fall. And to me, that's a sad thing. But sadly, the worldview has begun to creep into the churches, and it has been doing that for some time. I got saved in 1982, and I've seen so much change in the church from that time. Uh, it, it saddens me to see where it's come from because they do not hold to a world, biblical worldview. The, it, it's a wishy-washy mixed bag of, of things. And to me, that's just the amount of time that it's going to take them to fall. Because eventually, they're going to turn from God and go towards the world. Now, when we see this, they hold to a worldview that's based on everything from the world. And when that worldview comes into effect, what's going to happen is it's going to transform them into, an, into a liberal theology. And when the world of Christ... Christianity turns towards a liberal view, we're in trouble. We are in trouble because we are not going to see the things of the, of, of the word, the doctrines of God being stood upon. We're not going to see them to where they are the things that guarantee our, our ability, as I said earlier, to go to heaven. And, and it, I think there's going to be people shocked at the end of their lives when God said, depart from me for I knew you not. That's going to be a sad day. Last week I spoke on humanism. Well, humanism does one thing. It leads to transhumanism that we have today. Now when we see this, it's basically where man is trying to come to a place where it can integrate uh, AI or artificial intelligence into our own bodies. We see this and basically what they are trying to do, as I said, they're trying to create basically human 2.0. They're trying to create that better version that that will live forever, that won't find illness or sickness. That's something that is, is there. But why is it important to understand this? That's my thing. Why is it so important to understand that? And I believe it's this. I believe that the world is building within man a mindset. He's building a mindset within us that it's trying to teach us their way. And if they can create that mindset within us, it's just a short walk that we are going to go into an all-out liberalism to where we don't take the things of God seriously enough to stand upon them. You know, when I first come to Christ, I used to hear, and I've mentioned this before, you'd hear that word conviction continually. You need convictions, you need convictions, you need convictions. Stand on your convictions. Die for your convictions. Man, they were hardcore with that. You don't hear that today. And I think that's sad because we would not be willing to stand up and die for our convictions today. I'd be scared to death if that happened today. How many would turn? Because they wouldn't have the convictions to stand. But there's one thing that they're trying to do. And I mentioned this last week, and I don't like to rehash last week's stuff, but, but I do want to say this. The whole purpose of this is to do one thing. They are trying to take them back to where they have a greater knowledge than normal people. That is what it is. If they can do that, what happens is that they're showing that science is able to make them greater than what God can do. That's their desire. 
They want to be little gods. They want to have control of everything in their own life. And when that happens, why is it? Why do they do that? It's for this very reason. They want you to get to the point in your life where you don't think you need God. That you can do it with science. You can do it on your own. That's their point. That's their desire. If they can make you think that you're smart enough without God and you can do it with science, they're going to be happy. And I think that's where we fall. I believe 2 Timothy 4.12 brings us out, and this is where I want to get to. Because when we look at this, this becomes so relevant in our day. You know, today we see such a liberal thinking. Uh, everywhere we go, we see this. It, it doesn't take long because it, it does it for this reason. If they can get it in our head that we can walk with a liberal theology, a liberal life, then anything goes. You're capable and able to do anything. And that's where they want you. This is beginning to move into the church so much that it's scary. At least it does me. But then when you see churches that are trying to do the right thing, preach the right gospel, preach the way God wants the word preached, preach against sin, nobody comes because they don't want to hear that. But what this causes is them to come to the idea that in order for them to be relevant, they have to walk with a liberal theology. They have to walk with that liberalism within their life. But what that does, they think that it's the only way they're going to bring people in. And if you get on the internet very long, you'll see this. You have to be relevant. You have to be relevant. Well, who's setting the relevant bar? Who's setting that? What's guiding you in that? Is it the Word of God? Or is it liberal theology? It's something that we have to look at. Because if we follow their line of thinking and we begin to stand hard on sin and we stand hard on this Word, nobody's going to come. So we're going to water this thing down. We've seen this back in the early 2000s when you started seeing with this seeker-sensitive stuff. You've seen it everywhere. It all started from Saddleback in California. They, they started seeker-sensitive, that big church in, uh, in um, Chicago. They was that as well. And they started flooding us over the country. And pretty soon, if you didn't have a seeker-sensitive church, you weren't in style. I'm sure glad I've never been worried about style. I've never been worried about style because to me that's not what matters. So is it any wonder today we see so many of these churches are going what they call woke where everything's acceptable with this liberal theology and these things are springing up by the day. Churches are moving to this, preaching a watered down message and rejecting it or rejecting it entirely. Now I don't know about you but that saddens me. But the one thing about it is, is this. It's an indicator. It's that one in bench points that you set and you watch. Because what we're seeing then is where this is beginning to spit into society so much that eventually we're going to see God have enough of it. And he's going to judge. And when this happens, it'll fall. It's interesting if you look at history. Uh, I like to look at history. Even the Israelites, I, and I'm going to bring this out a little bit right now because I'm not coming back to it. This week I was, I was watching this um, one prophecy guy talk and uh, he made a statement that he was so ashamed of his country Israel right now because the leaders got up and praised the generals and all the people that had a part in winning in that, in that war that they had for those few days. And this guy got upset. He goes, why can't we learn from our history? They gave the credit to the wrong person. It should have went to God. Why would they give it to the generals? Without God's hand on us, we'd have never survived. And I thought, man, what a true statement. But yet, yeah, we're the same way. We see Israel that's rejected God and rejected God. God judged. They rejected. God judged. But yet, yeah, we are doing the same exact thing. Why do we think that we are any better than them? And that's what we have to see and understand. So it's sad to me to see all these pastors and churches taking and sacrificing scripture for society. I think that's just sad. I think it's so sad. People that sacrifice a word are nothing more than right there. They're false prophets. They're pastors in sheep's clothing trying to, to tell a message that is eventually just going to lead people to fail. 
I would hate to be a pastor that stands up before a congregation telling them the wrong message, and then when you get done with your life, you stand before God and have to get an account of your work. And how many people went to hell because you didn't preach the word? I do not want to be in that position. So if you don't want to hear the word of God, just tell me and I'll leave because I'm not going to change. I am not going to change because there's nothing of value if we do. We have to stand strong. I want to note from Timothy how all this come. But know what Paul told here. 2 Timothy 4.2. He said, preach the word. I love that. Man, bam, preach the word. And then he says, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Note the doctrine. For the time will come when they will not ensure, endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn into fables. Man, Paul laid it out, and that's the day we are living in right there. And I think it's sad that we see this. Paul gives us in verse 2 the mandate to what every pastor should preach. We have to take and preach the word, steadfast, immovable in it, because what we realize something else here is important as well. We are to guide those that sit in the pew. That's our responsibility. But there's also something here that's important that we need to understand. It's those that sit in the pew's responsibility as well. If that man or that woman is not preaching the word of God, then it's either your responsibility to change it or to leave. That's what must happen. Because those men would not get into that position unless the person or the people of that congregation gave them that authority. In a PCG, we are a congregational church. That means that you basically have that control to do. And that's what you always must understand. No matter where you're at or who that person is behind that pulpit, if they are not preaching the Word of God, then it's up to you to stand as a congregation to say, hey, that's not right, and it's time for you to go. Whether they're the pastor or a guest speaker, I would rather throw them out than have them preach something wrong and know they're doing it deliberately. Now, I've stood behind a pulpit and I've said things that were wrong because of ignorance. I just didn't know it. But then when I found out that I was wrong, I went back and apologized and straightened it out. And that's what matters. That's what it takes. Now, with this verse, I want to couple it with 1 Timothy. Note 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now when we look at these verses, they're, they're amazing to me because there's nothing more damning to an individual than stand behind a pulpit and speak the wrong thing, to speak the Word of God wrongly. But how great it is that when we speak the Word of God with power and authority, the things change. God moves in a great way. But yet, as Paul said, people don't want to hear it. They want those, those watered-down messages to where sin isn't preached against. Because when there's no sin preached against, the risk of conviction is no. There is no risk of conviction. That's the beauty of revival. The beauty of revival is to preach a message that brings people to a place of repentance. What did John the Baptist say? Repent, repent, repent. First G uh, message Jesus preached, repent, repent, repent. So if it's the first message that they both preach, it's something that we better pay attention to. It's something that we have to have in our mind that's so important that it never leaves. We have to come to a place where we walk with that constant idea of allowing the Holy Spirit to convict me if I'm doing something wrong. No. To me, there's nothing greater to do. But that man or woman behind that pulpit has that obligation to preach the Word of God in such a way. So when we take these two scriptures and we begin to compile them together and look at them as one, they stand out here as one important thing. And that is the importance of the soul of a man. That's what we see. We have to realize the most important thing in our life is not how much money we make, what kind of job we have, or what car we drive. What matters is, is how I'm guarding my soul. 
I need to guard my soul with every ounce of courage, every ability I have. Because when we can guard our soul, we realize that we will do what God wants us to do at that point. Now, there's one reason that we hold true to this. And Paul said this all through here, and that's by doctrine. We fight by holding on to the doctrine of the Word of God. Those things that are the, not, I, know, I hate to use the word rules, but principles, things that we know are truth. So we hold to them truths of doctrine and purity, knowing that we can stand. Paul makes this very clear in, in, in uh, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now watch what he says here because he states that those that fall away will be seduced by spirits. They will be falling away. Now who's falling away? I believe it will be the pastors as well as the people in the pew. They're both going to fall away because they're both going to be seduced to these wrong spirits. Lowering God to where he's no value to them. You say, well I don't see people doing that. Uh, trust me, they are. And it doesn't take long to see it. How many people on church, boy, they're all Jesus, and they're all gung-ho Christian, but you get them back on the job on Monday morning, and they're a totally different individual. That's not true. That's not right. That's not holding to purity. We need to be the same on Sunday morning that we are Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Saturday morning. We need to be the same. Because why? I'm holding to a pure doctrine. I'm holding to the truth of God's word, and I'm not going to move from them. But the devil comes in subtly, and he will teach subtly. And it's not something he's going to do all at once. It's going to start here and just gradually move to the point where he wants them to be. And we see this all the time because he's going to take and allow you in your mind to take these things for granted. How many times does the Holy Spirit lay something on our heart and we think, oh, I'll get to that later? And then later never comes. So are we walking in disobedience at that moment? Yes, you are. We have to hold true to the word and move away because God is the most important thing in my life. And if he's the most important thing in my life, the devil is not going to come in and try to convince me of another gospel, of anything that's different than what God wants us to be. So what we realize is that we as a church must stand strong. We must come to a place where we stand as a church, one, without compromise. Don't change. Nothing moves from this word. These doctrines are sound. They're secure. We hold on to them. The second thing is we do it unfiltered. We don't try to water them down. We try to stand with the purity of them, to the fullness of them. And that takes us to the third one, doing it unapologetically. I'm not going to apologize for the things of God. I don't need to. I don't, I don't need to because they're truth. And if they're truth, I don't need to apologize for anything. I stand strong and true upon them. But we realize we teach this in doctrine. And this, I've always been a, a big one to teach doctrine. I love teaching doctrine because it's so vital that we do. But realize something. If the devil can take and lead us away from the purity of our doctrine, then he has us. And we will fall. It's just a matter of time. Watch what Jesus warned us of. He said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. They want to destroy the church. Now, they may be so blind themselves that they can't even see it. And I think this is where it's at most of the time. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. You look at Joel Olstein. I feel sorry for that feller. Man, I've heard his father preach. His father was a preacher. I mean, he was a good man. And he took that thing over and took it to where everybody's good, everybody's happy. No, it's not that way. We need to hold true to the doctrines. Hold true, unbending, unapologetic toward them. Because we have to remember the responsibility for us is to preach the Word of God to lead people to salvation. And if we can lead them to that salvation, then they're going to be taught the right thing. They're going to be taught the goodness of God. By understanding these warnings and seeing the things that's going on in the world today, we come to a place to realize that the time of the Gentiles, as I said last week, are almost over. Now, I made this comment last week that we know we're almost at the end times when we see this time ending. Because the end, Jesus will not return to the time of the Gentiles is finished. That's us. 
That means right now, we are the apple of his eye. He's giving us the right to stand on the purity of his word and do his work. But when we turn our back on him like Israel did, he's going to turn his back on us. And then the days of the Gentile will be over and he's going to turn it back over to Israel. I am not preaching a replacement theology. Don't get me wrong. We need Israel. Everything in our world hinges on Israel. So what we are doing is coming alongside them and seeing what's taking place. And when this happens, we know that God's going to move. Now, this is where our eyes need to be opened. Now, we're going to go back to 1 Timothy here. Now, I want you to look at these things because we're going to break this down. And I don't have my watch, so we're going to see what time it is. All right, I got good time. When we look at this and we begin to see this, it's an amazing thing. Let's read it again. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, when we look at these things, Paul tells us, the Spirit speaketh expressly. I, I love that. I took a lot of time searching this out, this little word. I, I love these little words. Boy, are they powerful. And when we look at this, this is one of them. Because this word in the Greek is only used one time, and it's right here. And that got my attention. So I started doing a little digging and trying to find out what I can find. This is what expressly means in the dictionary. The word is, as I said, it's only found in this place. But it means to be outspokenly, distinctly, expressly. It means a matter of fact. That means you better be paying attention to what I'm about to tell you. That's the power he put behind this word. The Spirit isn't speaking in types and shadows here. We see that all through the Scriptures. But this time he's being plain. He's being to the place where he's in a decisive manner. He's basically throwing his fist down on the table and saying, Hey, pay attention. I want you to be aware of this and don't you forget it. That's where he's at. And that's the power he puts behind this. We have to realize that even a child with this word can realize the power and the importance of this warning. And we better see it as a warning to us. Because it's those for the last day. And I believe that is us. So when I look at this and see it, Paul gives us three things that will define the end times or the times of the Gentile. So the first one is this. Some shall depart from the faith. Now we hear this all the time. But every Christian needs to take this to heart. Because when we look at this, we see that in our heart and our mind, we have to stay focused on the things of God. We have to come to that plate, place because we have to actively... Let me back up. This basically means that we've actively departed from Christ. That means I actively with thought, turn, and walked away. As Pentecostals, we believe that we can lose our salvation. I firmly believe that, and we can back it up with Scripture. But the thing of it is, is this. At this moment, at this moment, is when these people turn and decisively made up their mind that they're not following God any longer. And this is what's taking place, and we're seeing this so often today, that people just totally turn and regret the time that they even came to Christ. Looking at it as something that didn't even make a difference in their life. But in verse 4 of chapter 4, we see that he said they'll turn unto fables. He said they'll turn into fables. Now, if you get around many biblical scholars, uh, you've got to really be careful. Because there's so many out there with so many wild views. And, and, and you, you better know what you're doing when you walk into that arena. Or they will turn you in a heartbeat. Because for one reason, there's so many out there that call themselves biblical scholars that don't even believe it's the Word of God. They believe it's nothing more than a bunch of fables that believes it's something that's allegories that's just there for, to give you an opportunity to, to grow from the story. No. No. I want to do a series on Jonah that I'm going to do in a couple weeks. I'm going to start it. I love the book of Jonah. I, I think it's an awesome book. It's one of my favorite books. But when I look at that, there's so many, that, and I've been studying and downloading all kinds of articles and, and writings and, and just reading. But, but it's interesting how many don't even believe that's real. And there's many people that sit in the pew that does not believe that that's a real story. Well, maybe I'm a little different because I believe it's literally happened. 
I believe that it took place. How? Well, that's not my problem. I'm not going to try to describe how. God said it, I believe it. I'm good with that. But there's so much there that people look at it and just call it an allegory or something that's a fable. Something that's just something that we can learn from. But we have to realize that this phrase of, of, of departing from the faith is where we get our word apostasy. We get the word apostasy from it, meaning that, that it's those people that's going to depart from the truth of the gospel and then lead others in that same way. And that's what's sad to me. Because what happens is that they end up just walking in a form of godliness. It's just a form when they need to have a complete reliance on the Word of God and make that the power of their faith. There's so many today that don't put the power of their faith to work. And this is where we see many today coming to this place. And to me, there's nothing sadder than that. But the big question is here. I guess I might as well move on past that. I missed it. The big question we have to ask is here. How does it happen? How does it happen that people walk away from the faith that easily? Because I've watched this for years, and, and it just drove me crazy for years. See people so on fire for God and then just turn away. How do you do that? I know how I came, and I know what I came from, and I know where I'm going. Why would I want to go back there? Don't even, does not compute. There's nothing there. But when I look at the reality of who I am in Christ, this makes all the difference in the world. So we have to answer this question, and we do it this way. Paul says, and makes it very clear, people will give heed to seducing spirits. Now, a lot of times today, we don't want to hear this kind of stuff because it just sounds like a horror movie. We don't want to hear about demons and seducing spirits and all these things. But I'm telling you, they're real. They are real. And you better be ready. Because when we see this, it's a very important fact. Now, this is what it means. That word seducing means this. It means roving as a tramp or a freeloader, an imposter or a misleader, a deceiver. And that's what we see today. We see so many that's following these seductive spirits and don't tell me they're not real because it goes right back to what happened in the garden. What did the devil want to do? He tried to convince Eve that she would be a god if she ate of the fruit. You need God for her. Just eat this and you got everything he's got. You're good. A seducing spirit is going to do anything in their power to take you away from God and the reality of his word. And this is what's happening today. The seducing spirits are in every church. You know, it's interesting, and this is just some of my own stuff here. If you don't believe me, don't. I'm okay. I don't care. But this is the way I look at it. And I, you know, I, I, I've studied Revelation for a long time. And I love the first three chapters. They're, they're where I spend my time because that's where we're at. But when you start looking at those, there's an interesting thing right in the beginning of that, that when Jesus walked through the candlesticks, the candlesticks are the churches. So when you look at these, what did Jesus say? I will remove my candlestick from you. But he also says in there that you're angel. Now that angel in that wording is a little different because sometimes people believe that it's talking of the pastor. And, and that's okay. A lot of people believe that. But I'm going a step further. I think it literally is an angel. I think that every church has an angel. Everybody believes that they've got a guardian angel over them, and I'm not going to deny that. You can back it up with Scripture. But I believe that every church has an angel over it. And that angel looks over me, looks over you. Now, keep this in mind. And this isn't in Scripture, but this is called reality of thought. If every church has an angel over it, I'm sure that there's a demon sitting right here watching everything we do. Everything we do, he's watching. And if he can get into the mind of the person behind this pulpit, or in a Sunday school room, or anything that can move the minds of an individual and seduce them into the thought of saying, hey, you got a better way. Take it. Go that other way. Man, you get more people. You get more money coming in. You, you get all this stuff. But Jesus said, depart from me. And that's why we must stand strong. Because those seducing spirits are real. They're there. Now, understand something. We see many today doing miracles. And I, I question those. I really do. 
Are they real some? I'm sure they are. But how many aren't? Now I say that because of this. The devil can work a miracle just as fast as anyone else. Notice what Jesus said in Revelation 16. For they are spirits of devils working miracles. He pretty much sealed it right there. Now we got a problem. What do we do? I hear all these people saying, oh, this miracle, that miracle, oh, yeah, that miracle. Praise God if it's from God. But when I start looking around and I start seeing things and start watching, because a lot of times I won't say nothing. I'm just going to watch. I want to see what's going on. And I listen. Because what happens is when we start to listen, we will realize that through their preaching and through their teaching is going to determine where that miracle came from. Is it a God or is it of the enemy? Now, I'm not throwing no names out because I don't think that's proper. But what I do believe is this. They are known by their works. Now, watch what this says in Galatians. Paul warned the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Oh, man, did he hammer him right there. He didn't make no bones about it. He said, hey, what do you think you're doing? Why, why would you move from here, knowing the truth, to this? Notice what he said, verse 7. Which is not another, but there is some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So don't tell me that this isn't happening. Those spirits are seducing into that position so they can perform a miracle just as fast as you or maybe faster. But we have to be careful. Miracles are just as real as the day Jesus walked. Don't get me wrong. I, I fully believe in them. And I believe that we can walk in, in divine healing. But I also believe that we have to be careful where that healing is coming from. So be careful. I, I don't care what time it is. I've got to tell you this. I was on Facebook last night. Man, I almost got on there, boy, and started typing because that fired me up. This girl, and I'm not going to, and she's in our district. I'm not going to say what church she goes to. But she put a thing on there about tarot cards. Now, uh, Marcia used to get mad at me because I'm different, boy. Anything to do with Halloween? Bad. I mean, I, I stay away from that stuff. Anything, anything that has looks of that, I stay away from. I've eased a little bit, not much. A little bit. Yeah, maybe that much. But this girl claims to be in Christ. She used to put their services on, Bible verses, and I hadn't seen her for a while. Or, you know, posting stuff. Last night, I seen this thing I come across. This person is doing tarot card readings. If you're interested, you know, call. And she wrote a thing at the bottom. Oh, I'm so excited to put me on. I'm there. Oh, man. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You kidding me? Boy, I, I wanted to go. And I thought, nah, they would boot me in a hurry. But, but it's wrong. I mean, come on. Come on. If you're going to stand for Christ, stand for Christ. We can't allow the things of the devil to infiltrate. And here it's already got into the minds of that individual. And by her knowing these other people in Christ in her church sees that, think, oh, if she's in it, it must be okay. No. No, it's not okay. Hold to the word. And it speaks distinctly against that. So we have to be true. We have to come to that place to where it's not a watered-down preaching that we stand strong on the truths of that word. We have to do this with reality, with the power of Christ in our life, to see the power of his presence in our life. But what we realize something else is what takes place. Because when we start to come to this place, it leads into a legalism. Now, I spent some time looking this up because liberalism is something that in my mind right away gives me them thoughts. What does that mean? Does it mean what I'm thinking it means? So I started doing some digging. But when I looked at this, liberalism in its truest form is placing ourselves into a place of freedom. That's what it's about. It, it's, it's about freedom. 
So when I look at this, it's a freedom with no oversight of God. It means that I'm free. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want when I want. That's true liberalism. And that's why people want to do it their own way and their own mind and thinking. And what we realize is that when we take God out of the oversight of our life, we follow down that path. And there at that point, the power of God is tarnished. It's tarnished to the place we nullify his gospel. And that is something that we cannot have. It's something that we cannot allow. But notice this. Paul then says this, that they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, such turn away. Well, you start telling that to people, they get upset. You walk up to say, hey, Ralph, that's wrong, brother. I don't want no part of you to get your life right. Well, you tell somebody that, they get, fat, they get all fusty, boy. They, they get fired up. Now I've got to be careful with that because I know we've got to have times of healing and we've got to have an ability to bring them back. But it comes a point that when they don't listen and they don't accept the forgiveness and, and coming back, then you have to separate, just like Paul with the Corinthians. So we have to come to that place where we understand the importance of that. I believe Paul here in this verse is talking about pastors. That's what I think. It goes far beyond the pew. I believe he's talking to Timothy about being a pastor. And when he talks about this and the reality of it, he's teaching to teacher, talking to teachers, pastors, and prophets. He says that when that individual is preaching another gospel, have nothing to do with them. Turn away from them. And so many times, these people look as having answers. You know, and this is what's scary. Because we live in a day where everybody believes what they're told. And when a guy stands behind a pulpit and tells you something, you think he's right. You think he's right. And to me, that's sad. You know, somebody said one time, we was talking about uh, Genesis 6, when the angels of God, or the, the sons of God and the daughters of men, and we had that conversation. Boy, you get into a firestorm with that one. But I'm always for a good firestorm. Well, I told them, they said, oh, that's the sons of Seth. No, 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 no. Those are fallen angels. They're fallen angels. Oh, oh, no, you can't have that. You can't have righteousness mixing with unrighteousness. And I said, yeah, that's a good point. But who they, they was trying to come up with a point that an angel couldn't have sex. It never says that. It just says that they don't need to. So when you start to look at that, there's a real firestorm there. But people believe what they're, they're taught. And if that person hasn't researched out something enough and they just say what somebody else told them, eventually that thing gets torn down. And we have to search those things for ourselves. We have to know the facts. Because if that person is preaching something wrong, how do you know? How do you know? Because all you're doing is blindly allowing them to teach you. We have to try every spirit in our day. We have to. If I'm wrong, call me out. I'll change. I'll fix it. We had a guy come one time. We had, uh, oh, I'm way out of time now. Anyway, we had an event, and our church at that time, we started with six people at that time. We, I think we was up to 20. And uh, we had an event at the fair, and the Sunday after that, we was at 45. We over doubled in one week. Boy, did I learn a lesson there. Because all you got was people that was coming from troubled places. And they brought their troubles with them. And this guy was into predestination, which is, you know, he's basically five-point Calvinist. But what he was coming with was the fact that, that can you change? He wanted me to change and believe in predestination. So it doesn't matter what I do in life, I'm going to heaven because I'm predestined for that. That was their thinking, their theology. He goes, can you change? I says, let me tell you something. I says, I will change. If God shows me from his word, but until then, I'm not changing. And that's not in God's word. So they never was back at the church again. And that's okay, because I don't need them bringing that type of doctrine to church. So we have to come to that place. I'm going to speed through these. Um, let's go to the next one. The third one is the doctrine of devils. Now, doctrine is instruction, the functioning or information, learning and teaching. Now, why does this happen? Why is it that people fall 
into this uh, doctrine of devils. And I like what Anthony Clark said. Anthony Clark said this, renouncing the whole system and effect by bringing in doctrine which render its essential truths null and void, or denying and renouncing such doctrines as are essential to Christianity as the system of salvation. I seen that thought, whoa, that's good. I, I like Anthony Clark. He lays it out. He's an old Wesleyan, but man, he's got some good stuff. But when we look at this and we see this, he's very right on. Because that doctrine is taking away everything that's essential for Christianity. That is what the doctrine of the devil does. It takes away the reality and the truths of God's word. And it brings us into a place where we can't understand what truly needs to be done. In this verse, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We all know this verse, but the whole point is, is this. When we start following the doctrine of demons, we come to a point where everything's accepted. If everything's accepted, like we're seeing in the, so many of the churches today, that eh, you're accepted, you come your way, I'll come mine, let's just all be happy together. No, that's not how it works. The Bible is distinct. There's no way unto the Father except by the Son. So when we look at this and see the reality of it, the devil is very cunning in the things he does. He's very cunning. And if he can bring our minds to that place, we will fall to that wolf. And to me, we have to understand that being in a place where we accept everybody for what they believe and accept that, we're in danger. We are in very, very bad danger because we can never allow that to happen. Jesus is the way, and we must hold to the doctrine of that no matter what people want to try to, to liberalize. We know that it doesn't work. We have to stay strong in the reality and the truths of the word. Father, we thank you for your word and with the blessings that we receive from it. Father, I, I cringe when I see so many that just walk away from the faith. Father, we know it's going to happen. It's, it's all part of life. But as sad as it is, it is a reality. I pray, Father, that you would give us strength. That as we go through life, that we wouldn't walk thinking that little of your word, but we would stand strong, steadfast, and immovable by the doctrine of your word. Father, we'd hold it with a purity. Father, that we could stand one day before you knowing that we did our best and that we could honor you in that. Father, I pray that you'd be with me as a pastor, that I would never teach or preach anything that would be contrary to your word. Father, that you would give me that insight we all make mistakes. We all see things in a different reality at times. But, Father, I know that the truth the Holy Spirit will reveal. So, Father, I thank you.